jokes aside, it is now three minutes after, so uh, so it's time for me to so it's uh, it's time for me to announce uh, today's speaker, who's our very own Will, speaking about the title that you can all see and read. And so, with uh, with that, I give it over to Will. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'll be talking about like work in progress, sort of today. Um, so let me begin with something relatively classical: the the configuration space of points in the uh, complex line. Uh, and which you also, if you want, can think about top topologically as the real plane. So um, there's a, a couple different flavors of how you can choose modular spaces of endpoints in the plane, because you can make them, uh, force them to be distinct, or you can allow them to collide, and you can choose them uh, labeled or, or unlabeled. Um, and so uh, conf n refers to the set of n distinct and unlabeled points in uh, the complex line. And then um, P conf N is going to be a set of N distinct labeled points uh, in the complex line. And then if you want to consider points which are not necessarily distinct, there's not going to be a special name because the configuration space is both uh, a is a n in, in both cases. So if you have N labeled points which are not necessarily distinct you can just view that as an because the coordinates are, are, are the are the locations of the endpoints that gives you um a description of it and if you have n unlabeled points that can collide you can view them as the roots of a monic polynomial of degree n and then the coefficients of the monic polynomial give you a nice isomorphism to n um and so these spaces are all quite closely related. The, the configuration space lives inside is a quotient of the pure configuration space by the symmetric group SN. Um, and then the pure configuration space lives inside AN as like the complement of this like big diagonal, which is the locus where any two coordinates are equal. So it's the union of a bunch of hyperplanes. And then the configuration space inside AN is going to be the complement of the locus where the polynomial has a repeated root, which is going to be the vanishing locus of this discriminant polynomial, which will have more complicated geometry than just a bunch of hyperplanes, uh, but it's a pretty nice polynomial. Uh, and so the, the last thing I want to mention in this classical context is, is the fundamental group of the configuration space is, uh, a, uh, is the braid group, um, which is a very nice group. So um, the spaces that I want to talk about today are only a little bit more complicated than this. Uh, we're going to fix a, a tuple of natural numbers summing to n. And instead of quotienting out the pure configuration space by the full symmetric group Sn to get the configuration space, we're going to quotient it only by Sn1 cross Sn2 up to, up to Snk, uh, which you know, embeds into Sn in the most straightforward way, where Sn1x are the first n1 variables and Sn2x are the on the next uh, N2 and so on. Um, so we can think of it as the moduli space parameterizing configurations of N distinct points, which are not labeled, but are colored with a color from, from one to K. And we have NI points of the ith color. Um, and this embeds into naturally approximate affine spaces. So uh, if ANI is gonna be the space of monic polynomials degree NI, then we can embed conf N1 and NK in a space of tuples of polynomials, F1 through FK, as the open subset where the polynomials have no common roots and no repeated roots. So it's going to be the complement of the vanishing locus of the discriminants of the polynomials and the resultants of the pairs of polynomials. Um, and so then we can consider the fundamental group of conf N1 through NK, which is like a variant braid group. It's going to be. Uh, braids of, of strands where the strands are colored with ni strands of the ith color and you have to compose respecting the color so uh i want to do something that uh from this perspective might be a little bit weird which is i want to think about the one-dimensional representations of this fundamental group 
the one-dimensional representations of the Bray group with co colored strands. Um, uh, I thought it would be fun to mention there's some kind of vague connection with physics, which is the, the representations of these kinds of braid groups uh, describe the statistics of like anions, which are particles in the plane that when you like rotate them in braids, they don't end up in, in the same like quantum state they were before. So people love to study like non-abelian anions in co quantum computing and something. Uh, and then I am will be happy to just understand uh, abelian anions. <laughs> Um, so, but when I say that I'm doing calculations with these representations, one thing I don't mean is that I'm trying to classify these representations, because the classification of the representations is not too difficult. Um, I'm trying to do some kind of answer some subtler questions. So, to classify one dimensional representations, we need to understand the billionization of this colored braid group. And the billionization is, is a power of z. It's z to the k times k plus 1 over 2. Um, and the way we can see that is we can write down a bunch of invariants of a braid that all, that all land in z. If you have two distinct colors, like red and blue, you can count the number of times that a red strand winds around a blue strand. And it's like you kind of it's like a winding number. So going once clockwise is plus 1. Going once counterclockwise is minus 1. Um, and so that gives you an invariant for each pair of, of colors. Uh, and then from an individual color like red, you can count how many times red strands wind around red strands. Um, so that gives you a bunch of invariants that all lie in integers. Um, and that gives you the complete abelianization. Um, and so what that tells us is that these characters of this group are parameterized by uh, um, k, k plus 1 over two tuples of complex numbers. Uh, yes. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, Andre in the comments says that this, this uh, studying abelian anions could lead to the Abel Prize. Uh, probably not for this particular research, but maybe there's something in there. <laughs> um, so the specific thing I want to calculate for these representations is something that can be pretty hard to calculate even when the representations themselves are simple. So um, it's, it's the intersection cohomology complex. And I want to explain what that is over the next couple of slides. So the general setup in which we can make the definition, in fact, even a special case of the general setup in which we can make the definition is we have some open subset U of some variety X. And we have a character chi, which I'll just think of as a one dimensional representation, although you can do this for higher dimensions, of the fundamental group of U. And uh, the chi defines a sheaf on, uh, on, on, on U, which I'll call L chi. And if you like coherent sheaves, I want to point out this is not a coherent sheaf, it's a constructible sheaf. We have to take this either on the analytic topology or on the etal topology to get a reasonable sheaf. And the intersection cohomology complex kind of answered this question of how should we extend this sheaf from U to X? Um, and it gives kind of the best possible extension uh, from a lot of different perspectives. There's a lot of different properties that you might want an extension to have. And the IC complex has basically every property that you, you could want. Um, the, only, the only property that you could want that it doesn't have that I'm aware of is you would sometimes really want to extend a sheaf to a sheaf on the larger space, but the IC complex doesn't do that. It, it extends it to an object in the derived category of sheaves. So it's like the nicest possible thing to do in the derived category of sheaves, but it's maybe unsatisfying if you would prefer to have like an actual sheaf. Um, so, um, the, the maybe the most elegant characterization of this uh, um, extension complex is, is, by, is by D modules. You can, you can take your, your character chi and you can define a D module by just taking the, uh, the structure sheaf and like just twisting, twisting it by chi, just tensoring locally with the sheaf and, and then taking global sections. And then you'll have differential operators acting on it because they're acting on the structure sheaf act, acting locally becomes a module for the algebra of differential operators on, on U. And then inside the algebra of differential operators on U, there's the algebra of differential operators on X. 
and you take like the minimal submodule for the algebra of differential operators on X. Uh, and that gives you the best possible extension as a D module. And then to go back to sheaves, you take like Durham cohomology and that, that gives you a sheaf. So this concretely for the functions you have in mind, this would be something like, I have to put functions like, you know, like the difference of your axis to some fractional power, is that the- Yes, it will, yes, yeah, so more precisely, it'll be resultants to a fractional power. I'll actually write, I'll write down that formula in a, in a few slides, so you'll see. Um, yes, exactly. Um, and then there's, there's a, there's a sort of abstract out the break characterization in, in, in the derived category, uh, which is, is, is very nice, but it is, is sort of unclear why this is exactly the right thing, which is we can extend it to the, to the derived category in such a way that um, we have a complex with cohomology in different degrees, and the cohomology in degree i has dimension less than dimension of x minus i uh, for all positive i. Or the dimension of the support of the sheaf. So each degree we have a sheaf, and then the support of the sheaves is shrinking. And if we take the dual, if we take Homs from our complex to the constant sheaf, and we look at the support of that, it satisfies the same exact uh, support condition that it's uh, less than dim x minus i for all for all positive i. Um, so uh, I, I want to talk about this also in a kind of more concrete construction, at least more concrete if you're, if you're not very comfortable with D modules, that um, because it, um, in part because that will helpful and also because it might help us later. So, uh, and the way we're gonna do the concrete construction is we're gonna first do it in the simplest possible case and then do it in a more general case and then talk about how, how to, to build off that to the most general case. So um, the simplest possible case is when X is the affine line and u is the affine line minus a point. Um, and so then L chi is the representation of the fundamental group of, of the affine line minus the point, which is z. Uh, and there's basically two kinds of representations of z that are one dimensional. There's trivial ones and there's non-trivial ones. Um, and so if it's, if it's trivial, then L chi is just the constant sheaf. And the best extension of the constant sheaf in this context or in any smooth context is just gonna be the constant sheaf again. So that's what the IC sheaf is. Uh, it's constant if, if chi is trivial. And if chi is non-trivial, then there's no real well-defined way to define what our sheaf should be at, at the point zero. So we just extend it by zero. And that's the IC extension. Um, and then if we're on affine space and we take a product, so U is the co complement of all the coordinate hyperplanes. It's the product of A1 minus zero to the nth power. Then because the fundamental group of a product is the product of fundamental groups, L chi will be a tensor product, L chi one tensor up to tensor L chi n. We should have more, I should have put more box times here of, of local systems that live on the various factors. And then in this setting, and every time you have a tensor product like this, it's natural to find, to find the IC sheaf as also the tensor product of the extensions of the local factors. Um, and this sort of gives you the definition for, for a general X. What you can do for a general X, uh, at least if you is smooth, is you can choose a resolution of singularities of X that turns the, that is trivial over U and it turns the complement of U to a normal crossing divisor. And then you could extend L chi from U to this resolution by locally uh, writing it uh, in this form. So locally a normal crossing divisor will always look like a product of like a union of coordinate hyperplanes like this, the complement will always look like a product of A1s minus zeros. And you can follow this recipe to do an extension locally. Um, and then the way that you um, get from the resolution of singularities back to X is you push forward and then you have maybe some complex with multiple components and you take only the unique indecomposable sum and which is supported on X. So, so by, by uh, giving this definition, I'm implicitly using a big theorem using decomposition theorem, which says that this like exists and unique and stuff. Um, but I think it's also a helpful perspective. Um, so now I'm going to sort of state the main theorem. This is going to be more, this is going to be 
following the, the title of the seminar is informal. I'm going to give a somewhat informal statement of the main theorem. I want to think, I want to fix chi, a one-dimensional character uh, of the, this colored braid group, and we'll consider the IC complex of the character chi as a sheaf on, or as a complex if she is on AN1 across AN2 up to ANK. Uh, and so I claim that this complex has a very close connection to a, a field in um, the subfield of the analytic number theory, uh, this so-called multiple Dirichlet series. Uh, and so the, 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 the statement um, that I proved has the form of, we can calculate the coefficients of these multiple Dirichlet series and the values of these multiple Dirichlet series using the stocks of this IC sheaf at particular points. Um, and so because of that, you can take, so because there's this very strong connection between IC sheaves and analytic number theory, you can look at what do people, sorry, I mean, people know about these multiple Dirichlet series in analytic number theory, and you can ask, is that explained by properties of the IC sheaf? And it turns out that it is. And then there's some very nice geometric properties of the IC sheaves that are sort of inspired by this analytic number theory uh, perspective. And, and I, um, I, I checked those and um, sort of the last point I want to make is that if we could find even stronger geometric properties of these IC sheaves, that would have some implications in analytic number. Um, so this talk is not mostly going to be about analytic number theory. I'll talk about it a little bit. Mostly what I'll do in the talk is I'll describe some of the structure of the IC sheaf. What, what are some nice properties it has? I'll, I'll explain what multiple Dirichlet series are briefly, and I'll explain the connection. And then I'll explain what are tools we can use to calculate this IC sheaf in some cases. And then I'll try to say something about the general case where I don't know how to calculate it, but it, I might hope to eventually be able to. Um, so, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the multiplicative structure that this IC sheaf has. So, the idea here is we're going to take two different tuples of monic polynomials, F1 through Fk and, and G1 through Gk. And we're going to try to understand the stock of the IC sheaf at the point of affine space given by F1 times G1, F2 times G2, up to Fk times Gk. And there's a very reasonable first guess for what this is, was it should be the tensor product of the stock of IC chi at F1 through Fk and the stock of IC chi of G1 through GK. Where in this context, these are all IC chi is living on different affine spaces coming from kind of the same character, but applied to different braid groups. Um, and the theorem, you can prove that this is true. You have this identity between the stock of one sheaf and a tensor product of two stocks of two other sheaves, as long as the polynomials uh, don't share a common root. Um, and so this is not just a stockwise identity. There's actually the identity of sheaves here. And so this identity lives over this open subset of the moduli space of tuples, pairs of tuples of monic polynomials, F1 through Fk and G1 through Gk, with the property that all the Fi's together and all the Gi's together don't share a common root. So the Fi's can have common roots with each other, the Gi's can have common roots with each other, but no Fi can have a common root with any Gj. Um, and so the identity under, under um, here is if we take the multiplication map from U to AN1 cross N, M plus M1, cross AN2 plus M2, up to ANK plus MK, that sends a pair of tuples to a single tuple, the pullback of IC chi under this map is going to be equal to like the tensor product of the two copies of IC chi from the two factors up to tensor product with a rank one least sheaf on U. So now let me, let me say the thing that Andre was asking about, um, which is we can, ex we can express um, deep, like the, um, 
this sheaf on, on the open set, El Kai, very uh, concretely as the sheaf of, of scalar multiples of some rational powers of these explicit polynomials. So we have here the discriminant polynomial of each of our FIs, and we have the resultant of a pair FI with FJ. And then these are well-defined non-zero, they're non-zero functions of the configuration space and they might vanish on the full affine space. And so locally on the configuration space, we can define these powers of the discriminant. Um, we can raise the discriminant to a power which I've denoted AII over two and that two will come in handy in a second. And we can raise the resultant to a power which I've denoted AIJ. Uh, and th that, those powers are defined locally, but not globally, which means we can make a sheaf of like this locally consists of scalar multiples of one of those powers. Um, and then we'll have a D module where the differential operators will act on it exactly the way you would expect differential operators to act on, the, on these powers using the, uh, the power rule, I guess. Um, and so that is, is, is one way of constructing Al Um And then this way of constructing Al Qaeda is very convenient for proving this kind of multiplicity property because the discriminant and resultant or multiplicativity property, because the discriminant and resultant polynomials have known uh, multiplicativity properties. So the discriminant of a product of two polynomials is the discriminant of one polynomial times the discriminant of the other polynomial times the resultant of the two polynomials squared. And so the reason this is true is the discriminant is the product of differences of pairs of roots squared. And so every pair of roots of FI times GI is either a pair of roots of FI or a pair of roots of GI, or it's one of FI and one of GI. And those will correspond to the three terms. So resulting of two polynomials is the product of the differences of roots of the first polynomial with roots of the second polynomial. And so the resultant of FIGI with FJGJ, well, every pair of roots of FI, pair of a root of FIGI and a root of FJGJ, it's either a root of FI or a root of GI, and then it's either a root of FJ or a root of GJ. So we have four possibilities, resultant of FIFJ, FIGJ, GIFJ, and GIGJ. And then up to a sign, we, we can ensure that the result, the F is, term is always on the left and the G term is on the right. Um, and this is fine because, uh, we, well, we don't really care about signs. The resultant is symmetric up to a sign. So if we take this identities and just multiply them together, then we get this product of fractional powers of discriminant of FI times GA times the product of fractional powers of resultant of FI times GI with FJ times DJ is equal to this discriminant factor for just F times the resultant factor for just F times the discriminant factor for just G times the resultant factor uh, for, just, for just G. And the remaining terms are all resultants of FI with GJ. Um, and so because we have this isomorphism, we have this equality of, 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 of functions locally, we immediately get an isomorphism of sheaves. So the first function corresponds to the pullback of this character sheaf along this multiplication map mu. And the set two functions each correspond to, to character sheaves or pullbacks and character sheaves under projections. And the last thing is we have this new rank one least sheaf, which is a product of uh, powers of just resultants of F with G. Um, and so what, what's convenient about this new sheaf is that because the resultant is non-vanishing on this open set U where the FIs don't share a root with the GJs, this new sheaf is least on the open set U. It's locally constant on the open set U where FI is, um, has no roots, share no, doesn't share any roots with GJ. Um, and, and so now we can use general properties of this intersection cohomology complex to lift this structure from the uh, open, uh, from the, from the uh, least sheaves to, to the IC complex. So we need to use the fact that this multiplication map mu is a tall on you 
because the polynomials don't share roots. And we use the fact that IC extensions are compatible with the tau maps. We use the fact that they're compatible with tensor products of sheaves on, on products of spaces. And we use the fact that it's compatible with tensor products with locally constant sheaves. We immediately get this identity of IC sheaves. When you start IC, it, chi is IC chi tensor IC chi, tensor this rank one least sheaf. Um, so this multiplicative structure means that if we're trying to understand the stocks of these sheaves, we don't really have to consider the stocks at very many points. So if I have any tuple of polynomials and it has two or more roots, I can write it as a product of two different tuples of lesser degree, which each have a smaller number of roots. I can divide the roots into two piles and put, put all, the, all the factors with roots in the first pile into F and all the factors with roots in the second pile into G. Um, and so by repeating this in combination with the previous identity, we can reduce the calculation of the stock of IC chi at a tuple of polynomials F1 through FK to the case when the FI all share a single root. Um, so you could say FI would be T minus alpha to the NI. Um, and then everything we've done is symmetric under translation in the complex line. So the stock certainly won't depend on our choice of root. So we can just think about the stock at a single point uh, in each degree, basically the, the point t, t to the ni, where t is, t is, I guess, the variable of, of my polynomial. And the other very nice thing about this stock is that it's equal to some global cohomology group. So we're trying to calculate the stock of IC chi at the point t to the n1 through t to the nk. And that's just equal to the cohomology of the whole affine space with coefficients in IC chi. Um, and the, the reason for this is there's an action of the multiplicative group on this affine space that preserves IC chi and it has a single fixed point TN1 through TNK. So the action I'm talking about is to scale the roots of the polynomial. So we take the polynomial F5 of T, we transform it into F5 lambda T, uh, but then we want to make it a monic polynomial. So we multiply it by lambda to the minus NI, where NI is the degree of F5. Um, so this scaling action, it, it multiplies the degree uh, R coefficient by lambda to the R minus NI. Um, and so then the unique fixed point is the one where the degree R coefficients are vanishing for all, for all positive R, which is T to the N1 through T to the NK. Um, so because it's just rescaling our polynomials, this preserves IC chi and this preserves, or this preserves L chi and therefore it preserves the extension IC chi. Uh, and, and so um, we could, then we can use general results that say the cohomology of some kind of cone reduces to the cohomology of the, the point of the cone or the cohomology of a space with an action of GM reduces to the cohomology of the GM fixed locus. And then the, it's all it's all negative eigenvalues. So there's no there's no shift. So using the the multiplicativity and um, this kind of local to global identity, um, we can we have an, an approach to kind of calculate the stocks uh, inductively, at least in principle. Um, so uh, the way that is, for my purposes, most convenient to think about it is to to use Poincaré duality between the cohomology of the um, affine space with coefficients in IC chi and the co compactly supported cohomology with coefficients in the, in the dual chi inverse. Um, and so because we're doing this inductively, we want to assume that we understand IC chi for all tuples of natural numbers n1 prime through n1, n1, nk prime, whose sum is less than n1 plus up to nk. So we can, we can calculate it for lower degree polynomials. And we're trying to calculate it for polynomials of fixed degree. And in this context, 
we can use this multiplicativity to calculate IC chi basically everywhere on a n one uh, through times a n two up to a n k because we can calculate it for any tuple of polynomials except if they all have a single common root. If there's any, if there's ever more than two roots, we can split and go to lower degree. So we can calculate it everywhere except for some copy of a one, which is embedded by this map. Alpha goes to t minus alpha to the n one up to t minus alpha to the n k. Um, and so in principle, we can calculate here the cohomology of the whole affine space minus a one with coefficients in IC chi. And then I say in principle, because just because I can write down a sheaf doesn't really mean I know what the cohomology groups are. And, and you can see that in some cases, these IC chi really do, do give you some quite non-trivial sheaf cohomology problems. Um, but um, it's kind of a clear problem. And if you can solve that, then you have this lovely exact sequence, which relates the cohomology of the whole affine space minus A1 to the cohomology of the whole affine space and the cohomology of A1. Um, and so this, this cohomology of A1 is, is just the stock that we're trying to calculate uh, shifted a little bit uh, in degrees. And this cohomology of the whole affine space is also the stock we're trying to calculate, just reversed in degrees. Um, and because we know the stock that we're trying to calculate only lives, lives in low degrees, we can take this cohomology of affine n1 up to affine nk minus n1, a1, and we know all the low degree cohomology has to come from the stock, and all the high degree cohomology has to come from this global this global cohomology. So we do, in particular, what we end up having to do is take the, the degree less than or equal to n1 plus n2 up to nk part of this cohomology and then shift it down by one. And that, that will give us the stock. So I want to now leave the realm of algebraic geometry. And I want to talk about some number theory. Okay, and if anyone has questions at any time, feel free to ask because I don't. Um, so I want to begin by talking about uh, the classical Dirichlet series. Um, so the Dirichlet series that people study in number theory are, are functions of a variable s. And the way you write them is as sums from n equals one to infinity of n to the minus s uh, times some coefficient, uh, which I've written CN because I was already using the letter A, you would normally write AN here. Um, and you, you don't take CN to be an arbitrary coefficient, then you could get a pretty much arbitrary function here. You want to take CN to satisfy the, the multiplicativity condition, where CNM equals CN times CM, as long as N and M don't share a prime factor, as long as the greatest common divisor of N and M is 1. Um, and, and so lots of functions that people study in number theory have this form to satisfy this, this kind of multiplicative. Um, and so one consequence of the multiplicativity condition is that um, any such function CN can be defined if you know what its values is on prime powers. You can tell its value on any number by factoring it into prime powers. Um, and so uh, one of the most important properties that Dirichlet series tend to have, although it depends on which multiplicative coefficients you throw in, are, are functional equations. So, so for example, if, if we throw in Cn is the Legendre symbol n over m. So this is when, when m is prime, this tells you if, if n is a square mod m, it's one. If n is not a square mod m, it's minus one. If it's a multiple of m, it's zero. And then for m not a square, or not a prime, you would extend this by multiplicativity. That would be, an this is a Legendre symbol, and that would be an example of a Dirichlet character. Uh, and, and if for CN a Dirichlet character, the Dirichlet series is going to satisfy a functional equation. And this functional equation will be some kind of relationship between the value of this power series at s and the value at 1 minus s. Um, and this is something that's very non-obvious from its presentation as an infinite sum, because the sum converges 
only for s greater than one or the real part of s greater than one, but it is in fact a true a true identity for the analytic enumeration. So, um, a while after Dirichlet, people figured out how to generalize this to a notion of multiple Dirichlet series. Um, and then multiple Dirichlet series will be functions in, unsurprisingly, multiple variables, S1 through SK. And um, written as a sum, it's just kind of a generalization of the usual notion of Dirichlet series. It's going to be the sum of, over tuples of natural numbers, N1 through NK, of the product from I equals one to K, NI to the minus S, times a coefficient, which now depends on natural numbers N1 through NK. Uh, but it turns out that you very often want to take these coefficients CN1 through NK to satisfy not a multiplicativity condition, but a twisted multiplicativity condition. Um, where CN1 M1 times N2 M2 or comma N2 M2 up to N NK MK is equal to the product of CN1 through NK times CM1 through MK times, for example, a bunch of Legendre symbols NI over MJ raised to some powers AIJ. Um, these will be integer powers, the Legendre symbols, not, not, not fractional powers in this context. Um, So, uh, and, and then this, you'll again make this assumption only when the uh, GCD of here, the product of N1 through NK with the product of M1 through MK is one. So there's no prime factor that's shared with, between some of the NIs and some of the MJs. So this twisted multiplicativity condition is a lot more unpleasant to work with than the ordinary multiplicativity condition. Uh, but one property that it does share is it means that to, to, to define CN1 through NK, it suffices to fix its values on now tuples of powers of, of a given prime. Because anything that's not a tuple of powers of a given prime, you can split it up in, into tuples of powers per prime. Sir, well, a uh, naive question. Yes. Uh, this, this series where you... Uh require NIs to be ordered? Are they part of this theory or is it, uh, can you make uh, the C vanish in some domains like that? Or is that, is that something? Uh, oh yeah, so I think that these um, like multiple zeta function type sums where you, mm -hmm. you demand, you sum only when like N1 less than or equal to N2 less than or equal to up to NK. I yeah. think those are just very different and there's not a lot of like overlap between the theories. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, these kind of comma, they, they come from certain like algebraic contexts where it doesn't make sense for these things to be ordered. Like they originally found studying like, what is it? Like automorphic forms on, 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 on certain uh, affine groups or something. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, something, something sort of different. Um, and so to really make the connection to geometry like a rigorous, we have to we have to generalize the multiple Dirichlet series again. We're, so we're now going to replace the natural numbers appearing in the sum with, with polynomials over a finite field. Um, and so the, the the first thing we're going to do is define. Uh, an analog of Legendre symbol for two polynomials or a finite field. Um, and so the way we'll do that is we just fix a homomorphism from the multiplicative group of the finite field to the complex numbers, uh, which I've been denoting by this weird box symbol. And so we can take for F and G monic polynomials over FQ, we can let um, this Legendre symbol be uh, defined as the homomorphism applied to the resultant of F and G. And we'll take it to be zero if the resultant of F and G vanishes. So the resultant of F and G satisfies multiplicativity properties, which are very analogous to the classical Legendre symbol and other properties which are very close to classical Legendre symbol. And then composing with the homomorphism to the complex numbers, we get now a complex valued function, which will behave in very many ways like the classical Legendre symbol. And so for a function field multiple Dirichlet series, 
we're going to again make a function of variables s1 through sk. Uh, we're going to sum over f1 through fk monic polynomials in fq adjoin t. Uh, and so monic here is the analog of, of natural numbers um, from a finite field fq. We're going to sum some coefficients cf1 through fk. Um, and instead of n to the minus si, we put q to the minus si times the degree of f i. So the analog of the size of a natural number n is going to be q to the degree f i. Um, and that's in part because the, the quotient of the polynomial ring by f i has cardinality q to the degree f i. So that's why we put q to the degree to the minus s i times degree f i. Um, and then we'll satisfy we'll choose our coefficients to satisfy the twisted multiplicativity condition, which is defined exactly the same way, except we have polynomials in here instead of natural numbers. And we have uh, this new Legendre symbol, which is defined using the resultant. Um, it'll still be C of F, F times G is gonna be C of F times C of G times the product of resultants of F with G. Um, and so there's one property that has been noticed for function to be able to multiply the Hirschlay series, which was not, is not true, is not meaningful for numbers. Um, all right, I should first say that <laughs> there's one property that is true, which is we can still use the multiplicative condition to kind of reduce the problem of, of defining or characterize CF1 through FK to, to reducing it uh, to, to tuples of powers of a fixed. Now, instead of prime, we're now say irreducible polynomial. Um, but there's a new property. And to see this new property, uh, you have to look at this power series, um, Q to the minus SI, degree fi. So in a classical setting where we had n to the minus s, each term had a different base of the exponent s. But here, there's many different polynomials with the same degree. Um, and so it might make sense to group a lot of terms. Or another way of saying it is this, this expression is clearly a power series in the variables q to the minus si, because this term is just a power of q to the minus si. Uh, and so it makes sense to express it as a power series in Q to the minus SI and to look at the coefficients here. And the coefficients will be a sum over monic polynomials of a given degree of CF1 through FK. Um, and so it's, it's kind of weird that we have two different kinds of coefficients. These C functions were like the analogs of our coefficients over the integers, which we're applying to a single N to the minus S or tuple N1 through NK to the minus S. And I'll call those the local coefficients. But if we sum many Cs over all polynomials of a given degree, then we get the global coefficients, which are the actual coefficients of the power series. And we write it as a power series in Q to the minus SI. So we have two kind of different notions of coefficients in this setting. One of them is a sum of the other, but it turns out there's another relationship. So th th there is a, um, these global, co there are cases when you have very nice explicit formulas for the local coefficients. And it was noticed by Chinta, Friedberg, and Hofstein that the formulas, you also have very nice explicit formulas for the global coefficients. And that these two formulas look basically identical. It's just like the same formula, um, except you basically switch Q with one over Q. That's and going then, to be the point correct duality, right? The, the yes. Q and, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, Chinta, Friedberg, and Hofstein would not express it in terms of a Poincare duality, right? They would just express it as, as a numerical statement. And then, um, uh, and then this was used by, by Diacono and Pasol to give a new definition of multiple Dirichlet series um, that they were sort of defined previously in a different way. And this probably was noticed. And then you can now, you can now use this property to define them because it uniquely characterizes them. And this, yes, so this is exactly corresponding to this Poincare duality and local global principle that we saw earlier. So I've sort of, pre I've hopefully presented this in a way that makes it clear what some of the connections are. So let me now try to make this precise. So the first thing you have to do to make this precise is take this geometry 
of IC chi, the definition of that, and do that all over a finite field instead of over the complex numbers. Um, and it turns out it works out basically the same as long as you make sure to use the atal topology all the time and not the analytic topology, which doesn't make sense. And you don't try to do things with D modules because D modules don't exist over a finite field, but you just use perverse sheaves and it all you know works out. And it was basically all worked out. Like everything is pretty much in, in, in BBD, I guess. Um, and so the new phenomenon that occurs when you work over finite fields is that everything in sight, and most notably the stocks of all our sheaves, has an action of the Frobenius automorphism from Q of finite fields. And so the theorem that relates these two things is that the coefficient of a multiple Dirichlet series C, um, C, F1 through FK, at a tuple of polynomials F1 through FK, is equal to the trace of Frobenius on the stock of IC chi at the same tuple of polynomials F1 through FK for chi chosen corresponding to the twisted multiplicativity property of the multiple Dirichlet series. Um, and so this gives a dramatic simplification of the construction that Diakonu and Pasal used uh, to make multiple Dirichlet series because they used Poincare duality and Italic cohomology, but they didn't have the language of reverse sheath. And so they were doing things in a much more difficult way. Um, and then uh, once you have built up the, the properties that uh, we discussed, the proof of this is very simple. So you can check that this trace of Urbanius of the stock of IC chi satisfies these properties of the multiple Dirichlet series. It satisfies the twisted multiplicativity property because of the twisted multiplicativity property. And it satisfies this local to global property because of this, this local to global um, thing with the GM action and this Poincare duality. And then you need to do an induction. You argue okay. those properties inductively characterize uniquely the function. Question. Yeah. Suppose uh, you gave up on the Apple price. It took some other representation of the of the braid group. You'd get some sheaf, right? Yeah. But it's uh, the problem is that this wouldn't be compatible with respect to tensor products and stuff. You need to have it. Well, there, yeah, there probably there given... are very nice representations of the braid group that do satisfy some kind of interesting compatibility with respect to tensor products. And then we'll get like a vector value to a multiple Dirichlet series. Um, I don't think it'll be vector value, right? Because you're taking the trace. Oh, I see the trace. Goes yeah, back exactly, to a number. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know which, I don't know which such representations would give interesting like Dirichlet series. Probably there are some, but I, I, I don't know. Okay, thanks. I mean, one thing you can do that's kind of silly is you can um, you can take this representation and you could take cohomology in, in one of the an factors, uh, and then it would still have a form of multiplicity, like varying, I guess varying n now, that just follows from the multiplicativity of, of your starting thing. You take cohomology, it'll still satisfy some form of multiplicativity, I think. Uh, and so you, you could try to do something with that. Uh, but that, that wouldn't be a very interesting example. Um, so there's another geometric property that I want to talk about, which corresponds to this analytic property that I mentioned earlier of the briefly of the functional equation. And um, for, for a combination of technical simplicity, and because I, I don't want to, and I, I don't know how to prove it in full generality, um, I, I'm going to restrict to a special case um, where these AIJs are half integers and the diagonal ones are zero. So basically in, in this product, we're gonna ignore the discriminants and we'll only work with like square roots of the resultant. Um, so this is kind of the, 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 the nicest case. And it's for example, the case where Diakonov and Pasal worked in. 
Um, and then what I want to do is define for each i, si, to be the set of j, where aij is not an integer, so where the square root power appears. And I want to let mi be the sum of nj over j and si. And so the reason that I'm introducing this variable um, is because this IC sheaf has a, um, a property. It doesn't depend entirely on F1. Like if, if suppose the degree of F1 is much higher than all the other degrees, the complexity of the sheaf is not going to keep growing as the degree grows. It's because it's only going to depend on what F1 looks like modulo the product of Fj for J and S1. Um, so said more formally, there's going to be some complex on AM1 times AN2 times AN3 up to ANK, such that when we pull it back to AN1 times AN2 up to ANK, along this map, which sends F1 to F1 mod the product of J and S1 Fj, we get IC cop. Um, so it, it, our sheaf is pulling back from a potentially lower dimensional affine space. Um, and we can use, in fact, the same sheaf on AM1 through AM2 through AMK for, for, all, for all N1. It doesn't really matter which one. And so the, the method of proof is, again, to first prove something on an open set and then extend. Is that a question? Um, so when we go um, to our picture with resultants, we have a product of resultant of Fi through Fjs. Uh, and we're trying to understand how does this depend on F1? Um, but the resultant of F with G only depends on F modulo G because it's equal to the product of the values of F at the roots of G. So you add a multiple of G to F and you get the same result. So, so using that, this expression res fi to fj only depends on fi mod fj, and the product only depends on this resultant of fi with, it depends on fi mod the product of the fj's where this exponent is, is not an integer. Where do we use that half integrality in this argument? Not yet. This part doesn't use half integrality. So I will, I'll, I'll use half integrality afterwards. Um, yeah, th this part is okay. Uh, yeah, it is, but we are using the fact that the diagonal is not finishing. Um, so, um, and then we can extend this to IC chi um, because uh, we're just pulling back along a smooth morphism and these intersection cohomology complexes are compatible with smooth pullbacks. Uh, and so this works when N1 is greater than equal to M1, because this, this morphism where you mod out a polynomial is like a nice smooth map from one affine space to another affine space. But if N1 is less than M1, it can't be smooth because it's a map from a lower dimensional space to a higher dimensional space. But you can handle the N1 case as well using multiplicativity. You'll multiply F1 by some high degree polynomial that's one mod the product of the FJs. And you can see that doesn't depend, that doesn't affect the stock. Um, and, and so, and so that you get the multiplicative, you get this uh, pullback characterization there also. Um, so, oh, my, my A's should be blackboard bold. Uh, so the, the next thing that I want to observe is that um, this vector space, AM1 of polynomials modulo the product over J and S1 of FJ has a natural bilinear form. And the specific bilinear form I want to take is you take two polynomials, you multiply them, you mod out by the product of J and S1 FJ, and you can use Euclid's algorithm to divide the polynomial until you get a polynomial of degree less than M1. And then I want to take the leading coefficient of uh, in that polynomial, so the coefficient of t to the m1 minus m1. Um, and so using this uh, linear form, bilinear form, there's a notion of Fourier transform. 
I can take any sheaf on a n one a m should be m one a m one cross a n two up to a n k, uh, and get another sheaf on a m one times a n two times a n k, or complex of sheaves to complex of sheaves, and we can think of it as a Fourier transform. Um, so if you like the d module picture, then this is like very straightforward. I just want to take all the x's and the di's in like the first variable and just swap the x's and the di's, like what happens when we take a Fourier transform of a function. Um, and if you like L-adic sheaves, which I don't think anyone here does, then there's also a very explicit construction of the Fourier transform using the Arden Trier sheaf. Um, and so, but uh, let me let me give a concrete description also. Um, I can give a concrete description. And the only drawback of that is that it won't look really like a classical Fourier transform. It'll look like something else, and it'll depend on if M1 is odd or even. Um, but uh, it will be a correct description of the Fourier transform in the setting. So, and I will just, for simplicity, I'll just give it when M1 is odd. So when M1 is odd, we have a correspondence between A M1 times A N2 to as A N K with itself, which is going to be the set of, of pairs of tuples F1 through FK with G1 through GK, where FJ equals GK, GJ for J is greater than one. And then this dot product F1 dot G1 is equal to one. Uh, and so this is a correspondence. So it has two projections to our product of affine spaces. And we'll define the Fourier transform to be the pullback along from the second projection to X, then the compactly supported push forward along the first projection, and then we shift by some number of degrees. Um, so this is like a radon transform type definition where we sum over a hyperplane, and you can check that it's equivalent to the D module Fourier transform or the L adic Fourier transform in this setting. Um, and then when M1 is even, there's also a definition, but it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so this property, here is where I do want to use the fact that it is half integer, that I have a more complicated statement if I did it. The Fourier transform of IC chi is just IC chi again, or IC chi bar, the, the, the descent of IC chi to this AM1 times AM2 times AMK. Um, so it's, it's it's stable under this Fourier transform. Um, and so the reason for this uh, is that the Fourier transform perverse perversity it preserves IC sheaves. So to check this isomorphism, we can actually check it on any open set. Um, and so the natural open set to take this is the open set where G two through G K or F two which are equal to F two through F K in our in our correspondence have no common roots at all and no repeated roots at all. Um, but we, we want to, we're going to allow F1 to have roots in common with G2 through GK. Um, and so what's very nice about this open set is that the um, configuration space, the complement of the configuration space is a normal crossings divisor because we just want to know that F1 doesn't share roots with these other polynomials. These other polynomials, the roots are separated. So it's a bunch of like independent linear conditions that, def that define the complement of the configuration space. And so in this setting, we have a really explicit formula for the IC shape restricted to this open set. And you can essentially just prove this identity by hand. Um, I mean, a more sophisticated way to say it is you're using the fact that the, the character sheaf for a transform on, on A1, the Fourier transform from A1 to A1 is going to be the same character sheaf again, or it's going to be the dual character sheaf, but we're using a quadratic character, so it's the same one again, and then tensoring that fact up. But you can you can just do it explicitly. Um, and so we're we're proving this for a duality restricted to this case where the roots are all very separated. Uh, and then using this IC technology, we can extend it to the case where the roots are colliding. And it's actually very interesting to look at um, in the case when the roots are all the same. So when G2 is T to the N1 and GK is T to the NK. Um, and so, so in this case, 
uh, um, using multiplicativity, you can see this dog of IC chi really only depends on the power of T that divides F1. And um, if you calculate what the Fourier transform is in this setting, it tells you an isomorphism between the stocks of IC chi at T to the N1 through T to NK and the stocks at T to the M1 plus one minus N1 up to T to T to the N2 up to T to the NK. Uh, that's if M1 is odd. Again, you can do something similar, but a little more complicated if M1 is even. Um, and so this relationship you get from the Fourier transform is exactly corresponding to what the analytic number theorists call, call the functional equation. Um, and so, but from a geometric perspective, the thing I want to do with it is I want to it's try to use it to calculate. Question. Yeah. Your, uh, your multiple geometric is the function of many variables, right? So you have an equation in, yes. in, each, in each one of them. This is the, the yes. first one. Right. Yes, yeah. so I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this next. Uh, yeah, so the, the same thing that I did for N1, it works for NI, for any I. I just made it N1 because that would make the notation simpler. And it was a little, a little notationally complicated. Um, so yeah, so what this gives us is it lets us calculate the stock at T to the N1 through NK using the stocks in lower degrees, T to the N1 prime through NK, where N1 prime is less than N1, as long as N1 is greater than halfway up. If it's greater than M1 plus one over two, then M1 minus N1 will be less than N1. Um, and so the same thing we can do for any I. Um, and so this suggests a strategy to calculate the stock, which is we take any N1 through NK and we try to show there exists some I such that NI greater than MI plus one over two. Or I mean, this is obviously not true if the NI are all zero. So we should try to prove this for any sufficiently large N1 through NK. Um, and if that were true, we would be able to calculate the stocks by induction. Um, and so it's a fun fact that to tell whether this is true, you have to make a diagram where the vertices are the numbers one to K and there's an edge conjecting I and J if and only if AIJ is not an integer. Uh, and then this uh, inductively useful statement is true if and only if this diagram is a spherical Dinkin diagram. Uh, and so for affine diagrams, it sort of just barely fails. And for hyperbolic diagrams, it like fails quite badly. Um, um, so when I say it can calculate the stock by the induction, because the even case is a little bit more complicated than the odd case, it doesn't mean I have written down a literal form. But this, this, uh, this uh, the statement about Dinkin diagram, does it yeah. really mean that uh, something of the kind that if you have, say, a hyperbolic thinking diagram, then uh, then the number of things you cannot determine can be put into bijection with some uh, imaginary roots or some such like the fundamental domain or something like that? Is that... Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, yes. Okay. Let me answer that. Um, wait. So let me just finish what I was saying first. So the the, the what. The, the identities are easier to work with if you go to the trace of Rubanius and you work with numbers than actually working with stocks. And so using those, Dyak and, and Pasal have written down in their paper literal formulas for these traces of Rubanius involving um, the, these, these complicated rational functions. So um, if you're, yeah, if I think when, when do you get in trouble? When do you not know? Um, what it, what is going on? What what what, what when, when can you not do the induction? Um, I mean the points which fail the induction are going to be a cone in the uh, like space natural numbers for the kth power. So if you have an affine Dinkin diagram, there's basically one diagonal of points where this doesn't work. Um, and so if, if you if you know you're missing information only on this like one diagonal line basically. Um, but uh, for hyperbolic thinking diagrams, there's going to be a positive dimensional cone where you don't know. Um, so it seems to me that's not quite in bijection with the roots because if the roots don't exactly form a positive dimensional cone, they would form uh, 
maybe they, maybe the roots would be the boundary of the cone. So there's a, there's, there's a cone where we don't know, and maybe the roots are kind of get, telling us about the boundary of the cone, because it's exactly where some quadratic form is negative, I think. And so the roots are where the quadratic form is almost zero. So I now want to get even more internal in this talk. I want to talk about what I hope that we may be able to do with this uh, in the future. So what would be really great is to actually have very good control in some sense on the stocks in, in the hyperbolic case. You know, in particular, at the very least, we want to know like what are the betting numbers of these stocks? What, what's the dimension of the stock in a given degree? Um, this could be very helpful for analytic number theory problems that use these Dirichlet series. Um, in particular, this has to do with the moments of the original quadratic Dirichlet L functions. If you're raising them to powers and then summing them, you can analyze that using these multiple Dirichlet series. And then for all the moments greater than four, the relevant Dirichlet series is, is hyperbolic. The Nikon diagram is like a star with, R, with the, the moment number of edges coming off of it. The exponent number of edges. Um, and so if we want to do this, we should try to find more structure geometrically than the analytic number theorists already knew about. So not just the functional equation and the multiplicativity and duality. we need to find something else. Um, and so I only have one idea about where we might find some such structure. Um, and the nicest way to, to get it involves extending Everything I was doing so far was on affine space, a one cross a and k, but you can just as well extend to projective space, pn1 through pnk. Um, and you can use the same uh, notion of an IC sheaf to extend from this open subset of affine space to projective space. Um, and so because we are now on a projective variety, we have, uh, and we're taking coefficients in a uh, self-dual pure perverse shape, we have a lot of the nice structure that we've come to expect for the cohomology of the projective varieties. We have Poincaré duality, which is the thing I'm going to talk about the most. We also have a pure Haas structure on each cohomology group, and we have hard life shapes. So, um, but the other thing that I can write down, so what I can do, or I can write down in this context is some operators acting on the, um, the cohomology. Um, and so the way the operators will, will, will work, where the first one will show up, is we take Pn1 times up to Pnk, and we add an additional factor of P1. And there are two ways to reject back to what we started with. We could just forget the original factor of P1, I'll call that per, or we can multiply it. We take the root, take the point on P1, alpha, make a polynomial whose root is alpha, so t minus alpha, and we square that and multiply that by f1. And so the reason I'm squaring is so that when I take the square root of the resultant, it'll be unaffected up to a rational function by this, um, by, by multiplying t minus alpha squared. Um, and so because I um, have chosen put a square there, we have a map from m star ic chi to per star ic chi. And the way this map goes is on an open set, uh, you can just write m star ic chi in terms of discriminants and resultants and per star ic chi in terms of resultants, and you just compare the two results and it matches up. Uh, and you can extend to the whole space uh, using weights, uh, understanding the weights of these two, these two sheaves. Um, and so, uh, that gives a map on cohomology where we take a cohomology class on uh, Pn1 plus two up to Pnk, pull back along this map M, go forward along this map M star IC chi to per star IC chi, and then push forward along per, integrate along per. That gives us a map of cohomology groups and it's shifting by two. Um, so we have this map, and then we also have the Poincaré dual map. 
And of course, I wrote it, wrote it for n1, but we have it for nj for all j uh, from, from 1 to k. So we have a bunch of operators. And it's nice to view these as like operators acting on the sum of all these Kolmogorov groups over all the n1 through nk. Um, so one thing we could do to understand these cohomology groups a little bit better is to try to understand the algebra generated by these operators and like its representation theory uh, and, and then see what representations show up in cohomology. So I, I, I sort of have reason to believe that these operators generate like a Lie algebra, which is exactly the Lie algebra whose Dinkin diagram uh, we wrote down earlier. Um, and so uh, if this algebra acts in cohomology, that would be an example of some structure which is not apparent uh, directly from the analytic number theory side. Um, I mean, it, it, it's a shadow of this structure is invariant because the vial group of this, this Lie group shows up. It shows up from the functional equations. But the, the Lie group itself doesn't show up directly uh, in the analysis. Uh, and if it did, we could try to understand these cohomology groups as representations of the Lie algebra. And that might be more viable than understanding them uh, without that extra structure. Okay, that's all, that's all I have to say. Thank you for inviting me to speak. All right. Uh, so how this, maybe I will start. Can I start with the questions and then we can? Sure. Like how, this, this question on this transparency, is that uh, how difficult is it to answer that? I don't know. <laughs> Smith, I... No, but say, so you have uh, your guess for uh, the operators corresponding to the simple roots, right? That's the... Yeah. Well, for yeah. the, for the, to some of the simple roots. So like you, the, these, yeah, I guess the simple roots. Yeah. Cause the, the, yeah, these should be the simple roots and they should generate under like commutators. Yeah. And then, but and I don't then really know how to calculate the commutators of an operator to find it this way. That's the kind oh, of- Oh, I see. I think the, the guys, so for example, if you, is it that's isn't this obvious that the ones corresponding to different uh to different nodes commute is that not not clear uh yeah so the fact that the ones that should commute do commute is probably okay but like that's not the only relations you need to check i don't think like you need to check you commute you commute two of them take the commutator and that commutator should now commute with some other things uh and that part is not as clear to me <laughs> No, but I mean uh, the definition of a of a like a cut smooth Lie algebra. What is it? It's uh, it's you take EIs, FIs, and HIs, and they commute the way you'd like them to commute, and then uh, and then it's uh, and then you have to mod out by some radical. But the radical you might have automatically because you probably have. Is there some do they? Is there some uh, inver non degenerate bilinear form or something like that? All these things. Oh, maybe. Yeah. See, I. <laughs> I don't know that much about Casimir algebras. So I mean, there, I mean, there's the only bilinear form is, is Poincaré duality, right? So if Poincaré duality is doing what we want, then maybe that's enough. And yeah. if not, I, I wouldn't know. So no, okay. you need, don't have to check the serial relation by hand, right? Because exactly. No, you need to check the serial relation. In fact, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's kind okay. of the usual. That's the usual argument in geometric representation theory. Do you wanna? Just uh, you don't check the serial relations. Okay, I will, I'll look into that. I will, I'll get back to you. Okay, more questions. Okay, I'll have the next question then too, and then uh, then if you just uh, this module with wrote down is that supposed to be. Uh, like uh, an integrable module for this for this Lie algebra, is that uh, kind of character-wise? What, what if you could just kind of guess what the size of that module? You think you think how big is that module supposed to be? Um, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, it's probably so. It's 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 probably very big. So 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 like these operators. They commute, they, they, they preserve Hodge structure or like Galois representation structures. Mm -hmm. So if you look in the cohomology groups and you find like two different Hodge structures, you know that they can't, they have to come from two different like 
irreducible representations of this algebra are like two different copies. Like it has to have like mm -hmm. a bunch of generators. And so you can look in these algebras and you can find some weird looking Hodge structures. And I think it's reasonable to believe that there should be infinitely many different ones for in the hyperbolic case, at least if you go far enough in the hyperbolic case. So I think that you're dealing with really something like infinitely generated. <laughs> So I don't, I don't know how good of a representation this is. Oh, I see. Okay. The only thing I know is you have these functional equations and the functional equations are sort of saying that some of these SL2s inside the group, the action is, is nice. It's not quite saying that some of these SL2s act like by, in, like by, a, by a union of fine dimensional representations or something, which is the nicest way you could hope for an SL2 to act. But it acts somewhat nicely. I see. And what about so in your uh, in this case, there's also should be uh, like a finite and a fine case. Is that is that understandable? What's happening there? Um, what sort of module you get? I uh, I think so. Yes. So what you would have to do is you'd have to take the description of this as an explicit. Uh, power series basically given by Diacon and Pasal, and you have to convert it, convert it into a, a representa representation theoretic description. Mm -hmm. um, so like if you, ex but, um, and, and I, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not good enough with the representations to, to do that. Like even in like the simplest non-trivial case, but- Like a cell too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Well, in SL2, in SL2, okay. In, in the one variable case, I can probably do that. The SL2. Case. Uh -huh. I think the simplest non trivial case is SL3. Okay. Yeah, I, I can do it for SL2 because just, it's just the, the, there's just like a left shit SL2, basically. Uh -huh. um, yeah, S SL3, I tried to give in it. It's not, it's not something like super nice. Like, I don't think it's like literally, I mean, patient. I mean, for one, because you have these different degrees that show up. Okay. Um, and uh, um, the other thing you could try to do is if you express those functional equations nicely in like representation theoretic language, then in the affine case or the, in the spherical case, it's kind of the simplest possible representation, which satisfies the functional equations. Um, so I, I, I don't, it's, I don't know exactly how to express that in a nice representation theoretic way because the functional equations end up looking a little bit weird because of the even numbers behaving differently from odd numbers. Um, but probably there is some description of that form as well. Um, cool. Uh, so what would be the, so you mentioned that this this kind of you know this multiple series you uh if i understood you correctly you mentioned that the multiple series you're interested in they have to do with uh for instance with uh trying to analyze the moments of uh, for the l functions of just a single variable single variety l function yeah exactly so it, it's it's something let me let me, be, let me say something more precise so if you if you take so if you take this L function mm -hmm. and you, you depends on a parameter M, you raise it to some power and you sum it over M mm -hmm. and you sum that against M to the minus S, like why not? You'll get something which satisfies the twisted multiplicativity condition, mm -hmm. but it will not be what people consider a multiple Dirichlet series because it doesn't satisfy nice functional equations. And so mm -hmm. what's done in the theory is to adjust the coefficients in a kind of ad hoc way to make it now satisfy these nice functional equations, then use the functional equations to understand it analytically. And then to, to when you want to get information back to the original problem, like reverse the adjustments you made to, to the coefficients. And so one thing the perversity perspective provides is it provides a new explanation of why you may want to make those adjustments to the coefficients. But the, the last step in an argument that converts this geometric information into analytic would I think involve taking this analytic information that we get from geometric information about the perverse sheaf 
and we get it for the modified coefficients and you have to convert it back to the original coefficients. Okay. Are there some other reasons? Well, I mean, I presume there are many reasons for you to consider this series, but there's some simple, other simple reason to look at series like this that you would be able to you know, say in, 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 in not too many words or is that? So, um, so supposedly they are, they're, they're, they're Fourier coefficients of metaplectic Eisenstein series. Mm -hmm. That is not very many words. I don't, I mean, I know what all those words mean kind of individually. I don't know why those words all fit together, but I, I'm told that this is true, that they're like four A coefficients of metaplectic Eisenstein series. Um, oh, metaplectic. Okay. okay. Um, and so they show up, they, they showed up originally in the theory of automorphic forms, and then people tried to use them to, to answer these, these kind of more classical number theoretic questions. Um, and and other than that, the only justification I know is that they come from nice perverse sheets. More questions? I feel like I'm doing all the works asking questions. I think that's my fault more than your fault. Oh, well, maybe. oh, well, okay, okay, okay. I think, uh, no, no, it's a. Uh, uh, it's not your fault at all. I think we should all thank you for a very inspiring talk. And I'm, you know, if you wanna, we wanna know more about Katz Moodle algebra, then uh, yeah, okay. I'm sure many members of the seminar would be really happy to have a chat with you. And so, uh, well, with this, thanks so much. And uh, we all electronically applaud and and then thank you. And oh, don't forget to send me the, uh, well, either the actual actual slides or links to slides or something. Like okay, that. great. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody.